All right, we can get some uh, housekeeping out of the way right now. Um, this uh, meeting will be recorded uh, for anybody maybe on your team that wasn't able to join, but maybe wanted to hear about the topic and the beer. Um, and uh, for any uh, Q&A, please just post in the box uh, and we'll address those questions as we go. And then we'll also have some time reserved uh, at the end. But like I said, uh, thanks for joining us today for our last call uh, hosted by Sanity Solutions. Uh, today, we're, we're with our friends at CloudBolt Software. Uh, excited to, to tell you guys about what they're up to uh, and also have our friends at Common Space uh, Brewery. Uh, we're um, kind enough to ship out a bunch of tasting kits and uh, we have somebody from the brewery on. So thanks, Common Space. Appreciate it. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, we'll kick things off here. So, um, you know, we've been talking with our customers a, a ton about cloud lately. Um, even just last week, we had an open house, if any of you were able to join us. Um, and we kind of talked about all the different types of cloud, right? So public is what I think most people think of first, all the hyperscalers. So AWS, Azure, GCP, IBM, those are all kind of the big players and we call those the hyperscalers. They have the biggest footprint uh, and typically somebody has some sort of instance in one of those. Uh, private cloud is just, you know, basically taking that cloud, that service delivery model uh, and streamlining the way you provision uh, and deliver resources on-prem. Uh, hybrid, I think, is where we find most people, where they have a combination of some on-prem gear that they're, you know, streamlining the delivery and management of, some uh, data sitting in a, uh, one or many different uh, public cloud instances. Um, so it's, it's not all one or the other. It, uh, we find most of our customers and, and most organizations are in this hybrid world. Uh, and then the last one is multi, which just like it sounds, uh, usually you know, a little bit of work going on in AWS, maybe some stuff in Azure, uh, and, and a blend of, of multiple different uh, cloud vendors, especially the hyperscalers. So um, for today, uh, we're going to kind of focus on the hybrid and multi-cloud space because that's where most people are these days. Um, and, you know, with, with uh, managing these two types of cloud, uh, there's, there's some unique challenges that are offered. Thank you. Good afternoon, guys. Uh, Nick Capiri here with Sanity Solutions, Senior Solutions Architect. So as Keith was alluding to, um, we, we have uh, multi and hybrid cloud challenges. And um, as part of those challenges, three of the main ones that we see is management complexity, secu security and compliance, and uh, cost and budgeting. And just a little statistic here as um, a 2019 survey kind of showed that hybrid and multi-cloud environments are really becoming more the norm. And that uh, showing that 93% of enterprises have a, a multi-cloud strategy and 80%, excuse me, 87% have a hybrid cloud strategy. Um, and part of using these uh, type of environments, especially the hyperscalers, is about accelerating time to value. Um, but while you're trying to accelerate time to value, you don't want to forget to pump the brakes a little bit and ask yourself, how do we ensure that we're using the best consumption models and economies of scale? How do we manage multi-cloud platforms uh, at once? And how do we ensure cloud security and compliance from a single pane of glass? And, and uh, we, we have some answers to that today with uh, our, our partner CloudBolt. Uh, but these are, are, are some of the major challenges as a part of these uh, multi and hybrid cloud environments. So we wanted to, you know, talk a little bit about a customer scenario because obviously talking about the statistics and everything is all good on paper, but uh, just a, a really good example of this is we work with a logistics company that uh, basically took one of their internal applications that is used to um, track their freight and they lift and shifted that to Azure. They, they're, they're doing a, a, a multi-cloud approach where they have some uh, software as a service. They have some on-premise gear that was uh, controlling some of their other applications. And then they were using that Azure for that application. Well, they quickly realized that they were experiencing about a $30,000 a month bill in Azure. And, uh, you know, needless to say, obviously Microsoft didn't really make them aware of some of the hidden costs that are, that are you can experience as a part of, you know, some of the higher scalers. The point is there um, that everything is metered in those clouds. 
and uh, especially with the hyperscalers. So you're paying for everything that you use and they just didn't realize those hidden costs. Ultimately, Sanity Solutions help them get into a more cost-effective solution. But the point here being that it's very important to make sure you understand what those costs are associated with running applications, no matter where uh, they are in your private, public, or you know, software as a service. Exactly. So that you know, this is this is a situation that a lot of our customers are facing, right? So our, you know, in the last several years, especially the last five years. We've, we've really said, okay, we need to obviously have alignment with these hyperscalers, but, but really our value lies in helping our customers better manage those instances. Uh, you know, whether it's determining uh, if a lift and shift is really the right thing to do, or if you need to refactor to really get, take advantage of the cloud. But really the biggest problem we saw, and that's what we're always focused on is solving problems, uh, is, is really containing the costs and knowing what's going on in all these different cloud instances. As you can imagine, it's, it's easy to get away from you. Uh, and early on, there especially just weren't any native tools and, you know, almost deliberately so that the, the big, uh, especially the big providers aren't going to make, you know, allow you to really keep a good grasp on what you're up to. There's a lot of shadow IT. There's a lot of, uh, you know, things sticking around that aren't being used. So, uh, you know, housekeeping and management is huge. So um, we've worked with a lot of you guys on on-prem uh, solutions. Uh, but, but we're really, like I said, focused on going beyond that on-prem storage or server solution we've worked with you on. Uh, and uh, there's a few different ways that our, our pre and post sales teams work with our, our uh, install base to, you know, um, basically enable uh, this hybrid uh, cloud environment where you may have workloads that need to move back and forth between different clouds or between on-prem and up to the cloud. Uh, we, you know, really help our customers out with migration. So if you're, you know, determined what it does make sense uh, to move to the cloud, you can determine, uh, you know, what workloads make sense and then we'll help you get them there. Um, and data protection is huge. A lot of the cloud vendors don't care about your data as much as you do. So both from a security and data protection standpoint, uh, just because it's in the cloud does not mean that it is secure or redundant. So that's always a big consideration for our customers. Uh, and then, you know, just making sure you have the right tools uh, and resources to monitor and optimize that cloud spend because cloud can be really powerful. But, uh, you know, as Nick described, it can it can get away from you pretty quick. Uh, so that's kind of where our value is. Uh, and like I said, this is a, a blend of services, software uh, and, and resources that Sanity has uh, for, our, for our customers. So the next slide here, we're just going to kind of display a few of our uh, cloud partners. So we, we have a lot of the hyperscalers, so the AWS is the world, Azure, uh, GCP. And we also partner with uh, some other partners such as Wasabi, Flexential, uh, and then obviously uh, the one we're here to talk about today and that, that being CloudBolt. And I wanted to just take a second to talk a little bit about why we partner with CloudBolt. And I'm not going to ultimately steal uh, their thunder because they're gonna go more into uh, the specifics about their product, but we really like the, the completeness of the vision of the technology. Uh, speaking to the underlying technology, it, it's an agentless uh, OVA deployment. Um, they're really extensible and have a lot of uh, integrations out of the box. Um, there's other things that we took into, consider into consideration such as ease of use and maintainability. And ultimately, obviously, uh, s some important things um, surrounding customer and uh, partner support. So uh, with that, we'll kick it over to our partner CloudBolt and uh, they can um, talk more about their product. Cheers. And real quick, guys, uh, just so everybody has a beer in hand, uh, like I said, if you got your beer kits, a good one to start with would be the Mexican Lager, the Sonrisa, or if you have the Hammock Street, those are some good light ones to start with. So. Uh, you know, feel free to go and crack one and, and cheers, guys. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Uh, cloud, cloud, all yours. Thanks, Keith. Um, so my name is Matt Hallahan. I'm the regional sales manager for CloudBolt for, for the Mountain States. Um, also joining me today, I hope, uh, is my, my peer, Lisa Wollersheim. I know she was supposed to be signed up as a panelist. I'm seeing her in the attendee list. I'm trying to get her to have chat capabilities or her speaking capabilities. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to be running point with, with her segment here. So give me a... Uh, I just swapped her over. I think she should be good, but let's double check. Uh, and then I'll start by uh, sharing my PowerPoint if possible. 
Are you at least seeing the, uh, the slide deck here? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Cool. You can see the slide deck, but not in presentation mode. Yeah, whenever I try to do presentation mode, my entire computer goes blank. So I figured this is probably the best and easiest way for me to do that. Um, all right, I'm gonna step in. Uh, it seems like Lisa might be having some issues. So again, Matt Hallahan, um, regional sales manager, Lisa Wollersheim, my counterpart in the, the Great Lakes Central region. Um, I've been with CloudBolt for about three and a half years. Um, so I've seen, I've seen our solution graduate and uh, become very dynamic when it comes to helping customers um, achieve better visibility into the public cloud, um, help them achieve better cost optimization, better security, uh, and all around just a, a better method for building, tracking, and managing their, their cloud resources. Um, so just to start with some of the, the key challenges that we see today, I mean, this is just a simple Google search um, for, for what the most prevailing challenges are in 2021 around cloud issues. You know, some of the big ones that stand out to me, and I, I expect may stand out and resonate with some of the folks on this call, um, is that number one, Shadow IT is responsible for 33% of all security attacks. Right, so one in every three is due to just a misconfiguration by an end user, maybe spinning something up in AWS and not managing it appropriately. Um, another big one, probably halfway through this, uh, this laundry list here is, last year alone, there was more than $14 billion wasted in the public cloud, right? So what can we do to help narrow the gap to make sure that customers are maximizing their investment in the public cloud? AWS, Azure, GCP, great companies, don't necessarily need them reaching any deeper into our pockets, right? So how, how can we help you just make your investment go a much longer way? Um, you know, and, and then misconfigured workloads leading to a billion dollars in lost records, right? Like a visibility is really at the core of everything that we do. You know, there's so many different disparate ways of consuming technology today with hybrid cloud and multi-cloud. Um, so if you don't have a very strong command and a strong grasp of what's living out in your IT ecosystem, how can you appropriately manage that, that footprint and make sure that you are maximizing your cost in the public cloud? So, you know, just looking at the, the IT landscape today, right, there, there's a, there's an, there's, the tale as old as time is just DevOps and internal IT, right? DevOps wants to become, accelerate and become more rapid and, and, and quicker time to value, right? But they have to do so under the, the purview and the guidance of their internal IT organizations. So there is just that, you know, constant conflict between internal IT that has a responsibility to the organization, but also developers to, rapidly develop new technologies and bring better business to the, or better value to the business. Um, but as we kind of spawn off into this hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, multi-tool world, there's a lot, many more stakeholders that, that are, you know, having a seat at the table when it comes to running an IT enterprise. You know, you've got security operations teams, you know, they're asking the questions, is everything that's living out there, uh, is everything secured and within compliance of our company standards? You got FinOps teams popping up now, again, making sure that they're making sure that every dollar is allocated appropriately within an organization. And then when I say multi-tool, it's not just spinning servers off onto VMware or spinning servers up in the public cloud. There's a lot of different types of currencies like Terraform, infrastructure as code, um, Kubernetes, right? There's so many different varietal ways of consuming IT today. So we need to understand how is everything working homogeneously? How is everything communicating well together? Right, so those are, those are the challenges that we're, we're out seeking to, to achieve. Uh, and this is the, the journey, right? The hybrid cloud journey. Um, cradle to grave, beginning to end. I'm gonna go for some CICD brownie points, but um, you know, using, using that terminology, the, the discovery and the security of, of your workloads pre-deploy um, and then post-deploy, how are you managing it, governing it, scaling it appropriately, right? So CloudBolt wants to help customers wherever they are in their hybrid cloud journey um, to, to better maximize you know, every dollar that's being put into their IT enterprise. Um, but do want to just take a quick step back and talk a little bit about CloudBolt as a company, you know, where we came from, where we're going. Um, CloudBolt was conceived about a decade ago as an automation project for a big federal defense and intelligence um, initiative mission. Um, so really simple, just helping them helping that agency accelerate the provisioning of their servers and their VMs. So orchestrating around the build steps of building a server, installing an operating system, securing it, installing different tools, et cetera, right? Um, but our founders having the foresight to realize the emergence of the public cloud, you know, we realize that there's a much 
bigger challenge out on the horizon around helping customers make better sense of this multi-cloud, multi-tool world that we're, that we're living in. Um, so again, our calling card today is helping customers wherever they are on their hybrid cloud journey. So we help organizations, as I mentioned on the last slide, gain better visibility um, to, to their otherwise complex infrastructure. Um, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, gain better, better visibility into their, into their infrastructure, um, accelerate and automate and orchestrate the provisioning of, of their servers and, and their different public cloud services, um, helping them optimize on their costs, you know, building in automation logic to help drive down costs when necessary and helping them secure and make sure that their the public cloud is always in compliance. Um, so the sheer ability to, to help customers in, in most any area has really helped us gain a lot of notoriety in our space. Um, we've become great alliance partners with some of the, some of the partners that you, you're consuming IT through today. So advanced partners with AWS, um, VMware Technology Partner of the Year. Uh, we've gotten a lot of recognition from, from publications like Deloitte, their fastest 500 going companies list. Um, we're also near the top of the Inc. 5000 list from last year as well. So um, a lot of exciting things happening uh, over here at Cloudbolt. So um, just going back to, to our solution set, the cloud journey that I mentioned and really where our solutions fit, um, you know, we want to kind of walk into the water from pre-deploy, deploy, and post-deploy, right? So pre-deploy, you know, first let's talk about cutting down the costs and the headaches of integrating stuff. You know, we, we offer what we call integration as a service. So that really means instead of custom coding all of your integrations between tools and platforms, um, we take a much more intelligent approach to, to abstracting an integration layer and using software policies to kind of define your integrations. Um, so, so your business logic drives these integration templates, we'll call them. Uh, and then you reuse those integrations countless times. So it's really useful when you're, you're leveraging different platforms like Terraform, like Ansible, like ServiceNow, like VRealize, right? So it drives down the manpower, um, drives down the time spent uh, and the budget that gets allocated for, for those different integration projects. Um, and then deploy, you know, that's the actual self-service IT function of CloudBolt. Um, so we allow infrastructure teams, cloud operations teams to provide their end users with a catalog of blueprints where they can go and order stuff. It can be a VM, it can be a cloud service, it can be a container or a full application stack. Um, anything is a service really. Um, and this is all done according to, to the rules and, and the pre-definitions uh, that the IT team set up for those different user groups. So um, end users get a lot faster access to the workloads that they're ordering. Uh, and then the internal IT teams uh, and the leadership have a much better track on what's getting created, who it belongs to, what's its purpose, where does it live, those types of things. Uh, and then continuous optimization post-deploy and securing of, of your entire cloud ecosystem. Um, again, through automation, we're able to, to track the, the spending and the trending of each workload, of each group, of each environment. Uh, and then we, we give you the, the ability to create policies to right size, to throttle, to decommission workloads based on certain criteria or, or certain behaviors. Um, we also measure every workload against a number of different compliance best practices, uh, and then we give you, the consumer, or you, the IT admin, uh, a full visual representation of where all of your security threats are in each of your cloud workloads. So, you know, if something needs to be patched or, or something's on a storage bucket that's out of, out of company compliance, you'll be able to see that and act on it immediately. Um, just a few customer voices that, that kind of embody CloudBolt's value because ultimately the question is what, what's the payoff here for me as the consumer, right? Um, Home Depot, they've been a longstanding customer of ours and kind of the beacon for accelerating IT delivery. Um, so they came to us long before I was even working at CloudBolt and they said it's taking us entirely too long to deliver the VMs from the time that a developer is requesting it, right? So by automating all the build steps that go into delivering a VM uh, and orchestrating that entire delivery method, uh, we've helped them knock that provisioning time down to just a couple minutes. Um, intercontinental hotel groups, I always trip over my words with that one. Uh, IHG, they are the governing body for a number of different hotel brands, and those hotel brands have very differing IT makeups, right? So the value here was their ability to create a cloud of clouds, so to speak, with CloudBolt. I think they have yeah, six different private and public cloud footprints that they're managing. So they're able to roll that all into one singular view with CloudBolt. And then with role-based access controls, they're able to easily route 
the right person to the right cloud to access the right resources, uh, all while maintaining that one holistic view of everything. Um, cost control and optimizing your cost. That's obviously a big, big one with organizations as they continue to grow their, their public cloud footprint. Um, so we have a case study with Newstar where we explain where we're able to drive down their public cloud consumption or their public cloud bill by more than $3 million on an annual basis. Um, I think really you can, you can probably interchange Newstar with a lot of the companies that we support, but you know, we're talking savings amounts of like 20, 30, 40% or more over their entire public cloud spend. Um, and then putting a wrapper on this, you know, governance and security, Delta's got hundreds of different developer groups that are requesting IP. Um, so the ability to, to properly define the rules up front uh, and leveraging automation to deliver IT to those teams, it's drastically shrunk in their incident management time considerably. Um, and then, you know, just to, just to sum everything up here. So now that we've addressed a lot of the challenges, I hope and expect that some of those challenges resonate with you folks on the phone or you watching the recording. Um, I would hope that your next question is, where do we get started? What's, what's next for us, right? Um, so Lisa, albeit, sorry that she wasn't able to speak on this call, but um, Lisa, myself, our entire team, uh, we would love to continue the conversation with you. We've got a, a number of these different uh, savings calculators and ROI tools that we can work with you on. Um, that's usually a great starting point to really show you how you can monetize CloudVault's value. And then you can take that, that message and share it with the rest of your organization. But I mean, honestly, we would really just like to sit down and spend some time hearing about some of your initiatives and some of your challenges and just giving you a front row seat to, uh, to demonstrating our, our solution. Um, I also don't believe that we'll be able to get Jeff Broussard on as a panelist either. I thought that maybe we could do a quick demonstration through him, but um, I'll make sure that my information is shared with all you folks. Uh, we'd love to, to, to follow up and again, come back to the table and really understand how we could partner with you. So um, greatly appreciate your time. I hand it back to you, Keith. Awesome, Matt, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so you know, we, we want to keep it short and sweet for today on the technical side. Uh, please follow up with your account teams. Uh, such a cool tool, the dashboards, the visibility, the reporting, the compliance tracking is just so powerful and something that really no other platforms we found can provide. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's something that uh, once you see it, you kind of see the true value. So just let us know. We'd love to get in front of you and your team. Um, and yeah, just follow up with, uh, with your folks at Sanity. So without uh, further ado, we'll, uh, we'll hand it over to Trent uh, at Common Space for the fun part here. Uh, he uh, got the, they sent out the, the tasting kits to everybody. So you should have a variety of beers from these guys. He selected a few that we're going to taste today. Uh, give you some details about what makes them different, what they're doing uh, at their brewery out in California. But um, yeah, thank you guys so much uh, for joining us. And uh, yeah, cheers. So uh, bottoms up. Thanks, Trent. Awesome. Thank you, Keith. Uh, yeah, my name's Trent. I'm with Common Space Brewery out of Los Angeles, California. Um, more specifically, I'm in the city of Hawthorne. So if anyone's familiar with LA, uh, we're real close to LAX and we're down the street from uh, SpaceX. Uh, the first question with that is always common space, SpaceX. There is no correlation. Uh, we do have a lot of their employees coming in for beer, um, you know, after, after probably a long day of <laughs> trying to get people into outer space or making rockets, but, uh, we just focus on the beer. There's no, there's no relation. Um, yeah, feel free guys. If you have any questions or comments, um, you can interrupt me, we can chat, um, or if you just want to write in the chat box, feel free. Um, but I'm going to go over a few beers. I'll go over the brewing process and uh, talk a little bit about us as a brewery, but we can also chat about what your favorite beers are, what your favorite breweries are. Um, yeah, let's get into it. So I believe Keith had you try already uh, our Mexican lager, the Sun Risa. Um, that's a great place to start, very light bodied lager. Um, we do use corn in that beer, so that adds a little sweetness to it. Um, and it's one of those beers, right, you can have all day. Um, on the golf course, you know, at the beach, backyard, like cookout. Um, I've worked in the beer industry for about 10 years now, and I've had the big double IPAs, triple IPAs, you know, Russian Imperial barrel aged whiskey stouts, um, you know, 12% or what have you. I've kind of swung back to, you know, um, you know, lighter lagers, you know, more palatable like pale ales or IPAs. Um, something that you want to drink and you want to have maybe one or two, three of them. Um, you know, that's something that's 15% and you're going to be 
on the ground afterwards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, the, as it starts warming up, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we got a lot of beer drinkers on and we love the doubles, but as it gets hotter, there's nothing better than a crisp cold. And actually, I don't know if you heard this story. Somebody was explaining the history. I think it was on some TV shows going over the history of a lot of beer. And they were talking about the history of Mexican beer. Uh, they said that when the Spaniards came over and kind of conquered Central America, you know, they all brought wine and uh, the locals didn't really take much liking to it. So then once all the European tourists and the Germans came over and brought their beer, you know, the, <laughs> it was something that you could drink cold on a hot day, you know, on a Mexican beach or something. And uh, the, the, you know, Central American culture really embraced these nice, cold, crisp beers. And a lot of the Mexican lagers that are out there are like, you know, 500 year old, usually German lagers. Uh, on the lighter side and then you know had their own interpretation over time but that was a story I heard and I was like it it changes your perspective but I mean of course all, all beer stems from one of only a couple places but uh, yeah. I thought that was kind of funny uh, red wine doesn't sound as good on a hot day that's for sure <laughs> that sounds like uh, you'll be getting an early nap with that one uh, yeah I haven't heard that story that's interesting but yeah I mean it, that kind of makes sense uh, because you know a Mexican lager um, is a very light bodied you know uh, straightforward lager and lagers um, and pilsners come from Germany. Um, I apologize if you guys hear, I'll try to, I don't know if you hear on your end, they're doing some demolition of uh, the apartment next to me. So I, again, apologize if it, I'll try to talk over it. They're like jackhammering all the tile. So that's awful. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Uh, let's drink some beer. So we're going to do the three beers that I have for uh, my portion, guys. Um, again, feel free to keep drinking that Mexican lager if you'd like or any other beers catch your eye. But uh, the ones that I'm going to do tastings on, uh, for my part, it's going to be beer number one. It's going to be our fresh pills. Oh, sorry. Just kidding. Beer number one is going to be Hammock Street lager. That's beer number one. Uh, beer number two is going to be our fresh pills of L.A. And then uh, beer number three, it's going to close us out. It's going to be our West Coast style IPA, the Yaser IPA. Um, so go, go ahead. If, if you're joining me on the tasting and you want to go kind of in order, uh, feel free to crack open this one. That's our hammock street lager. I'm going to pour ahead or pour a little sample myself. Um, you know, I'm not the boss here. So I don't know what you guys have on your schedule, what you're allowed to do or not. Uh, some people like to drink the whole thing. I'm just going to do a sample because I still got work to do today. Uh, yeah. Cheers, guys. Thanks for hanging out. So, Trent, is this what you do eight, nine hours a day? You just uh, sample beer? <laughs> uh, not, <laughs> no. Uh, I, have, I have another job as well that's also uh, remote. And so it's been, um, it's been nice. Uh, I've, I've worked in beer. Pandemic hit you know, stuff happened. I got a, a different job and then common space, uh, over the past several months, it's, uh, has had me doing this. So, uh, it works great, but, uh, I'm working from home and sometimes again, the apartment next door is being demolished, but no, I don't do this eight or nine hours. Um, the craziest, <laughs> the craziest one I've had one right before this, but my craziest week was St. Patrick's day week. Um, I had, I think six, I had three one day, three the next day. So that was, that was, uh, by the third tasting, there's a little bit of, okay. Uh, <laughs> Everything <laughs> tastes awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, let me know what you guys think of this, this first beer. Again, that's a, that's a lager, um, German style lager. There's going to be compared to that Mexican lager. Um, Mexican lager is a little bit sweeter, um, lighter body, lighter in alcohol. Um, this has a little more maltiness to it, a little more saltiness. Um, still, again, very light, crushable. I, that's, that's not a beer term. That's a Trent term. Uh, <laughs> cr crushable. Um, but yeah, man, I, I really enjoy this lager. Um, I like our can art as well. We, uh, we have a few different artists that do our cans. Um, this kind of looks like an old, old style beer that you would see, like maybe like your grandpa drinking or something. Uh, the so dog... It's become like one of the cooler parts of all these craft beers, like all. Oh the, yeah, the can art, the, especially on the tall can. Is I there love it. Significance to the name Hammock Street? Is that an actual street, or is it just is that just sitting in your hammock drinking it? Oh no, that's a that's a great question, Nick. Yeah, Hammock Street uh, is actually an ode to 
um, that's the street our founder lives on. And originally he was going to call, uh, call the uh, brewery Hammock Street, like brewing company. Um, but we landed on Common Space, um, which I think is a, is a way better name, but this is kind of a, an ode to that original idea. Um, you know, Common Space being a place where no matter who you are, race, creed, color, religion, what have you, uh, you know, we're more similar than we are different. Come have a beer. Um, you know, we welcome everyone. So uh, we wanted to make that kind of not just in, a, in our marketing or just a tagline. We, we just straight up made that our name. So, um, yeah, the Hammock Street is is the street that Brent is his name, is our founder. So, uh, and then the dog is actually um, our brewery dog. So one of our brewers, Andy, has an Australian Shepherd and Dodger, she's in there all the time. So she's kind of like a honorary mascot of the brewery. Oh, cool, we got some folks coming in. Yeah, and I, uh, I just opened it up actually uh, for audio. So if there's anybody on the call that has any questions, or wants to chime in, if you just go ahead and in your bottom left corner, you can unmute yourself. Uh, you, feel free to type into the, the chat area, but uh, if also if you want to just unmute and ask uh, Trent a question directly, feel free and uh, let them know what you think of the beer, so. Cool, thanks, yeah. Again, feel free to interrupt. I love questions, comments. If you wanna talk about your favorite beers, that's great too. Um, cool, uh, let's see, we got one here. Lisa's asking, yeah, uh, about the artists. We do. Um, depending on the style of the beer um, or kind of the theme or the idea behind it, we'll, we will, um, uh, you know, pick different artists that, that work well with that theme. Uh, we have one beer that's kind of like flying off the shelves right now. It's a hazy IPA or milkshake IPA. It's called Chubby Unicorn. Um, so it's got this big uh, kind of, you know, literally a chubby unicorn on there kind of floating through space real cartoonish, um, you know, the can label gets you, you know, just solely on the can label, you, you're like, well, I'm interested. Uh, but our brewmaster, Kushal, his brother is an actual, uh, he's a professional animator. So he's worked in animation for years and years and years. Uh, he started on, I don't know if you guys remember that show Futurama back in the day, but he uh, worked on that show. And uh, so he, he's designed a couple like cartoon type labels for us as well. Uh, so that's pretty fun. Uh, good question. Uh, do we like, now that we have folks in here, uh, do we like beer number one? Do we prefer these like lager, you know, more crisp, light bodied, kind of all day drinking beers? It's good. It's really good. I, I uh, between the two, there's subtle differences between the Mexican and the, the hammock, but uh, they're both, yes, very sessionable, crushable, all those things on a hot day. They're really good. Right. <laughs> yeah. 4.8%, nothing crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I love, I love a, a solid lager. I think uh, from a brewery perspective, if you can make um, a solid lager, Pilsner type beer and a West Coast IPA, um, you got my thumbs up. Cause those are, um, especially lagers or Pilsners, those are very difficult beers to make. You can't really um, mask it with anything, right? If you, if you mess up, you could throw maybe more hops in there or more malt or some kind of fruit, or, uh, you know, if you're making a stout, throw more coffee or chocolate in there. Um, with lager, it's just, it's, you know, the water is what, uh, shines out in that, right? So in beer, you have four main ingredients, water, hops, malt, and yeast. Uh, and with these German style lagers, what we do is there's a reverse osmosis process. So we break down the water, and then uh, manipulate it to emulate or mirror that type of water for whatever region the beer is from. Um, and same with the hops. So these German lagers, we're using German hops um, and German malt. Um, so if you guys have ever had like New York bagels, right, outside of the mm -hmm. city of New York, like New York, uh, they do this, a similar process with their water. So they try to emulate that, that same, uh, you know, mineral layout. Uh, well, cool. Should we move on to beer number two? Yeah, let's do it. Hey, real quick, quick question. So, I mean, I imagine no different times a year, you guys brew different types of beer based on demand. I imagine in the winter, it's darker, maltier stouts and porters and IPAs. And then summertime, I, I bet you guys sell a ton of the Mexican lager, the, the hammock, a lot of, I mean, IPAs seem to be just year round pretty popular, but do you guys pivot your productions to kind of meet those changing demands based on the season? I know, I guess California is a little different because you guys don't have the same seasons, but 
depending on that, where you're shipping. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I was going to say, uh, Keith. It's a little different. Um, I think you guys are coming from all over the place, but in Southern California, it's it's almost the same, give or take five or 10 degrees year round here. And so, um, excuse me, so we'll always have uh, a handful of loggers on the tap list. And, and that also has to do with our brewmaster, Kushel, the previous brewery that he was at, they only made ales. So the first thing he said is like kind of pitching himself to, to work here. And he, he's one of the founding guys too. He was like, we need to make sure we have several log loggers on there as a challenge. Um, Cause they take longer. They're in the fermentation tank for six to seven weeks where ales are only uh, in fermentation for three weeks. Um, so we always have loggers on. I mean, our IPA is a mainstay, this one that we're going to try at the end. Um, but to be honest with you, I, you know, we'll put on some stouts or like porters, you know, in the winter time, but maybe like one or two. It's not like we, we don't adjust it that, that much. Uh, we're always putting out new beer. We have probably the same six to eight beers on at any given time. And then we have probably, you know, four to six new rotating things throughout the season. So uh, and it's more so like what we feel like doing, you know, there's, you know, certain seasons bring certain beers, like you said, but here, here where we're at, um, you know, I think we only have one stout on there. And so I'm kind of like you, even, you know, I'm from the Midwest originally, uh, I'm from Missouri. So I kind of want to drink with the seasons, but <laughs> when it's, you know, 80 degrees outside, I'm like, I'm not drinking a 10% <laughs> yeah. coffee stout, you know? So, right, right. Yeah. Um, Let's go ahead and move on to beer number two, guys. So if you want to crack that There might be a question. Up. Was there was there somebody on that wanted to ask a question? Uh, looks like somebody oh, might have. Oh, feel free. If not, no worries. I just want to make sure we give them a chance. All right, all you. Sure. And raise your hand on here or literally just cut me off. No, no worries. Um, beer number two for our tasting, guys, is going to be our Fresh Pills of L.A., Again, so we're on the lager train here, but this, if you can tell, go ahead and try that one. This one is also dry hopped. So what that means in beer talk, the similar process that we do with IPAs, we add additional hops and fermentation. So on the nose a little bit, there is a little bit more hop aroma and there is a, a slight bitterness towards the end of your drink on this one. Uh, so cheers, beer number two. And let me know what you guys think on that. So would you say that you guys have like a signature taste or, or a uh, signature beer that uh, kind of defines um, a lot around what you guys, you guys represent from a, a brewery? Mm, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I would say this one, this Pilsner has been around for a long time. And then the one that we're gonna try at the end, the Yaser. Um, we're, we're known pretty well for those two, but this series that we started doing that chubby unicorn, the hazy milkshake one, those sell like hotcakes. It's crazy. Um, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll make however many cases of beer and, it, and it's sold out in a couple of weeks. So, um, I don't think there's any one particular thing that's like, this is what common space does. We, you know, we try to have a, a, a wide range of choices because you know everyone likes different beer um but this one is what brought me over this one's been around the pilsner and again this is an old school one and then the milkshake ipas um i might uh i might get um kicked out of this event but are you guys going to get into hard seltzers and do you have light beers <laughs> uh the lightest beers the uh the live spirits that we have are the ones that we've, we're trying right now. So these loggers, uh, if you're talking light, like calories. Yeah. I'm trying to watch my figure these days. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> with craft beer, uh, it's pretty difficult to do. Um, you know, uh, I always say if you're going to drink a beer, drink a beer, maybe do, you know, another, a, a lap on the treadmill or <laughs> a couple more crunches. Because it, it, it's pretty hard to make a, a decent beer, uh, you know, with a very low caloric intake. Um, you know, that's where you go with like the Michelobes, right? Or the, or like Miller Lights or what have you. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
but uh, in terms of craft beer or the stuff that we do, we, you know. Yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> but we, uh, in terms of seltzers, um, I'm seeing that everywhere. We haven't personally made one. Uh, we're not against it or anything like that. Um, you know, that that's very popular right now. So I'm seeing a lot of, uh, you know, craft seltzers or um, gluten-free options. Um, I would almost say personally, this isn't common space, this is just Trent. Um, I would go for a seltzer before I'd go for a gluten-free beer um, because at least, you know, the seltzer is kind of its own thing. It's in its own lane and you know what you're signing up for, but with gluten-free beer, they use these adjuncts, they use like sorghum and these like artificially made products to like, it's, you know, beer in, it, in its full form is just liquid bread. <laughs> it's like chock full of gluten, you know? Um, so it's, it's hard to do. I, I haven't seen, there's one brewery called Omission out here on the West Coast, Omission, uh, that makes a gluten-free beer that's like, okay, but it, that's hard to do, man. Cause like, again, yeah, it, it's uh, half of this thing is malt, it's grain literally the same thing as br bread so <laughs> i can say this because i work with the guy but i think it's ironic that user 318 had to use an alias to bring up seltzer on a beer conversation <laughs> <laughs> i'm smart man i'm smart how am i doing really questions about <laughs> the, health, the health aspects of drinking <laughs> <laughs> now nah, but um, good, good stuff i like it so far thank you awesome um yeah, we, we can talk a little bit about this one. Um, you know, I, I'm a 90s kid, so I love this this label, right? Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Um, if you look on the can, there's, a, you know, there's some little uh, little hidden uh, LA type things in there, right? I didn't, I didn't notice this until a couple uh, calls ago. On our basketball court, there's Kobe Bryant's numbers. In Dodger Stadium, there's a 42 for Jackie Robinson. And there's a couple other little things hidden throughout there. But that's a fun, fun can design. Uh, that beer is still very light body, 5% alcohol, not that crazy. Um, still, you could do that one kind of all day, all afternoon. Uh, but it is, it, I don't know if you guys can tell, there is a little hoppiness, a little bitterness at the end there. Um, did it's you guys Randy's, get, go ahead. Is Randy's Donuts, is that a good, is that a good spot? Is that a local spot? So, I mean, I'm sure you've seen that giant donut in like The yeah. Simpsons and other cartoons <laughs> and movies. Um, excuse me. Um, when you think like your classic, well, I don't know what you'd call it, coffee shop or diner donut, that's Randy's Donut. Uh, it's, it's a fine donut. You know, my parents wanted to see it when they visited. Uh, yeah. You got to do it, you know, get right. a photo with the giant donut. But it's just a classic regular cake donut. Um, sure. Sure. And it's close right. to the airport. So if you fly in, might as well go to Randy's, right? It's as much the sign as anything else, I'm sure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, did you guys get those packets with, um, like the ingredients and whatnot? Would you want to, we can go over that. That'd yeah. Be fun. Yeah, please. Yeah. We got the little, so everybody, if you had the little, uh, like Manila looking envelope, uh, inside of it, there's, there's a little, uh, kit of some stuff here. So I'm going to go grab that. Sure. Yeah. Take your time. Um, so yeah, if you got that envelope guys, um, there's two smaller envelopes, uh, in those, and this is more of a sensory type of deal um uh you can check it out you know pour it in your hand give it a give it a smell but i i always say don't eat it there's always one person on there just because i said don't eat it they like eat the hops i'm like that's disgusting we, oh. we like to drink our malts and drink our hops we don't want to eat it so um i'll give you guys a quick rundown before we get into our final beer of of the brewing process as a whole and i'll, I'll be quick with it here so uh, if you want to grab your malt packet, we'll start with that. Uh, so according to the old, old Germany purity laws for beer, there's four main ingredients. It's water, malt, hops, and yeast. Uh, if you guys ever go into a brewery and you see that, that first set of tanks where they're standing up on that platform, on that deck, uh, that's called the brew house. Uh, I know a lot of uh, <laughs> chain restaurants or like BJ's or what have you, they, they call themselves a brew house. It's like a marketing term, but literally that sections called the brew house that's what that is and so that first container is called a mash tun so that's where we have our malt and uh, we hit it with a bunch of water it's pulling all that natural sugar out of there 
um, getting a really sweet, sugary, malty water. Uh, we call that wort. A uh, wort then gets transferred over to the second container, which is a boil kettle. Uh, we boil the wort and we add two rounds of hops. So one of the rounds is for aroma. So you can smell that. Um, some hops give off, um, you know, tropical fruit notes. Some give off um, almost like a dank, like cannabis, because uh, hops are our um, cousin to cannabis. And, uh, you know, some have more earthy um, kind of flavors there too. But uh, in, the, in the hop kettle, we'll add one round of hops for bitterness, one for aroma. Then we transfer that hop wort over to fermentation. Uh, in beer, there's two major styles, right? There's ales and there's lagers. Uh, if you're making, and then all the other categories come off of those. If you're making an ale and fermentation, we crash the beer, cool it down, and that sits in fermentation for three weeks. Uh, lagers are in there for six to seven weeks at a colder temperature. And lagers and ales, this is where we introduce the yeast. They have two different types of yeast strains. Um, we like yeast because yeast is breaking down all that naturally occurring sugar um, from your malt, creating CO2 and also creating alcohol. So yeast, <laughs> if we like beer, we like yeast because that's where we get our booze from. Um, if you guys like IPAs, this is where we add another round of hops. Uh, we call it dry hopping. So if you guys want to take out that hop packet, that's where we add the hop pellets, uh, additional hop pellets. Um, so for anyone that's really into pale ales or bitter beer or uh, IPAs, Again, another round of hops. Um, if you like coffee stouts, this is where you add your coffee. Uh, if you like anything with like a, a fruit or puree. Uh, if you guys have ever had like spicy beers, I've seen some IPAs with like chili peppers in it. This is where you do that too. Um, and then you filter the beer and then you package the beer. And that's like the simplest way to, <laughs> from, we call it from grain to glass. Um, that whole process at the beginning on the brew deck takes about five, six hours, fermentation, anywhere from three to seven weeks. Um, and then once your beer is packaged in a can, bottle, or a keg, um, they say 90 days. And so I know a lot of us always have that beer that gets lost in the back of the fridge. Um, check the can by date. You know, if it's, you know, if it's a Budweiser or Miller, like, I don't think that really matters. <laughs> There's not going to be much tasty notes on that. Um, again, I'm from Missouri, so I'll still drink, you know, a Budweiser at a, at a ball game or what have you. One time I drank, I was trying to get the most bang for my buck and I drank a Stone IPA at a Dodger game. Uh, and uh, that's the one and the only game I ever fell asleep at the game because it's like 9% and it's like 90 degrees. So, you know, pick the right beer for the right time, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, well, I think it's time uh, if we want to move on to our final beer. That sound good? Funny, you said there's always somebody uh, who, who, who eats the hops or whatever and uh, regrets it. I, we had this place we used to do customer events where you could uh, go and they'd, they'd walk you through the, the whole malt process and you'd grind the malts and do the mash and the whole thing. You, they basically oh, cool. do the hard parts and you could do the fun part. But the malts are good. They almost taste like cereal, but the hops, somebody who knew and wanted to mess with me, they told me to just eat a pellet. And uh, man, that's like eating a whole bushel of, of hops. It was... Uh, it took a couple of days to get that taste out of my mouth. It oh was, man, it yeah. it's crazy how concentrated these things are. It's a, it's a lot in just a very small pellet. <laughs> I would, yeah, again, I would not suggest no, don't, it's going to it. wreck your palate. And that's not fun. Yeah. Um, but guys, <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and try beer number three. Hey, user 318 has another question. Yes, please. Where do you not distribute to? I live in Kansas City, and I don't think I've seen you. Oh, you're in Kansas City. Um, go Chiefs. Um, yeah. I grew up in Jeff City, and I'm actually visiting my folks next week in the St. Louis area. I'm going to a couple Cardinals games. So, um, I'll be in St. Louis on Wednesday. Nice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Boulevard Wheat, man. That was like water back home. That's what I grew up on. There you go. Um, uh, so to answer your question, we only distribute uh, in the, the larger LA area. So we're, we just celebrated three years. Um, our next big step for us in terms of distribution is getting into local chains and uh, grocery stores. Um, so right now, um, well, during the pandemic, we were doing like home deliveries of to-go beers. Um, but that whole thing, uh, user 318, <laughs> uh, we were very, very new on so um 
I don't think we'll get any type of uh, distribution that far out for quite some time. Um, you may be able to order online. I know that's, you know, we're doing that with these tastings. I don't know if you can order. Um, I can throw a website in here for you. If you can order um, our beer online at right now, I should know that. But I got all the way to the part where I had to enter email address and then there was something about shipping on there, but I don't know what the regulations were. I didn't take it a step further to see if I could get it shipped to like Minneapolis here. Yeah, I, I'm gonna say probably not. Um, just because uh, again, like we just dis distribute, um, we, we have our own, we, we self distro. So our employees are the ones driving like beers to stores and restaurants and stuff. Um, so hopefully sooner than later. I just sent the uh, link to our website though, our web store. Um, good question though. Uh, let's do our final beer. Yes here, West Coast style IPA. Is anyone in here an IPA fan? You make it fruity enough for me. Yeah? Do you like hazy IPAs then? That I do. Okay, there you go. Always in my we uh Matt, we sent one in your package, I believe, the food fight hazy IPA. I think I'm still waiting on mine to show up. Oh shoot, okay. But I'll I'll be guzzling those down this weekend. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Well cheers guys, it's been a lot of fun. Let's try our, our final beer here. So while you're taking a pause there, uh, what constitutes a West Coast style IPA? I've always wondered that. I've seen it and I've noticed that it's typically a more like citrusy IPA, but I was wondering if you could fill me in with what specifically constitutes a West Coast style IPA. No, I mean, that's you, you hit it right on the head. That's a big uh, factor, right? Citrusy, uh, bitter, usually about this color to about copper in color, usually around six to 7% ABV. Uh, there's a term called hop forward where the bitterness lingers on the front part of your palate. Um, yeah, when you think, you know, when I think West Coast style IPA, I just think you're like old school, like the grandfather of IPAs, right? When you think of like a classic IPA tasting, right? Like you're, uh, your Stone IPA or your Racer 5, um, Dogfish Head, like, uh, you know, your, your old school style IPA, that's what I think of. Whereas New England or East Coast, right, it's gonna be more juicy, cloudy in appearance. Um, and those are often not bitter, right? Um, sweeter as well. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much the uh, the main things that make up a, a West Coast style IPA. And they got popular out here, especially in, in Southern California, right? We, San Diego kind of ran with that style and, and made a name out of it. Uh, good question. Uh, so this beer, guys, 6.7%, definitely a little bit higher than our last ones. Um, you have a couple of these, it'll probably sneak up on you. <laughs> but for an IPA, I think it's it's very drinkable, very smooth. Definitely um, got a lot of hops on the nose. Definitely some bitterness at the end and um, some like tropical fruit notes in there as well. Um, I love the name of our beer. If you read, it's got like a little definition on there. And so uh, the story goes, our founder, his name is Brent. Uh, he's kind of the big, the big picture, like the optimist, like the dreamer type. And then our uh, brewmaster, his name's Kushel. And he, uh, Brent says he's a pessimist. He would say he's a realist. And early on making the brewery, there's a lot of like budding heads, right? And so, you know, this came about like, we're making great beer for great people. Let's have fun. Let's do it the right way. Uh, we're going to come up with, uh, you know, obstacles and disagreements, you know, but don't be a naysayer. Don't be like a negative Nancy. Be, you know, positive. Be a yaysayer. And let's, uh, let's make some awesome beer. So that's kind of an, an ode to that. And Got some fun little characters on there. They like Dodger baseball out here, so there's the blue baseball. Um, I get a lot of crap at work because I'm I am not a Dodger fan. <laughs> you're a cards guy. <laughs> through and through, man. If you're from Missouri, uh, unless you're close to the KC area, it's pretty much a religion. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Nice. 
That's really um, good. I'm, I'm excited to try the other ones. Is this your best selling out of the IPAs or I, I know you guys have like three or four. That one's been around for the longest. And yes, that's, that's kind of, um, there was a question earlier, like what, what we're known for. Um, people around town know the Ace Air IPA and it's been around for, I guess, three years now. Um, yeah, I think you have, you have a hazy IPA in your package, right? Um, you have the Space Trees IPA as well, I believe. Um, that one's interesting if you guys want to get into that later on your own time, but that's made with cryo hops. And so that's a new technology. That's why it's like the future of the IPA or whatever. Um, it's a new technology where it's like a more condensed, um, concentrated um, hot pellets. And so there's, there's some nuances with that beer. Um, that one, in comparison to Gaser, I think it's even cleaner. Um, uh, and it's easier to drink, but I think it's actually a little bit higher in alcohol, which is funny. Um, yeah, guys, this has been great. And let's you and anyone has any questions, comments, or um, I think that's all I have for today. That's great. Trent, you're the man. Thank you. Appreciate you taking yeah. us the tour, tour de beers. And uh, yeah, excited to try the rest of these. So uh, you guys do a great job uh, getting everything out too. It was a really cool little kit. And I'm sure you guys have been doing a lot of these. So uh, we'll, we'll make sure people know how to find your beer. And uh, yeah, man, we'll, have to, we'll, we'll find you again for another event. This, this was great. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you guys so much. I hope you guys have a great rest of your, rest of your day, rest of your week. And if you're ever in the LA area, come check us out. We're open now. Um, the city's opened up a little bit more. And the only days our tasting room is closed is Monday, Tuesday. All that's on our website or social media. Uh, but thank you guys for supporting. These virtual tastings have been a huge, huge help. Um, during the pandemic, we've had an overwhelming amount of response and it's definitely helped us, uh, stay afloat. So we're very appreciative. Uh, and you know, if you want to do another one of this, think of us and, uh, otherwise cheers, have a great day. Talk to you later. Thanks Trent. And with that, uh, we'll say cheers for the night. Thank you for joining us for happy hour today. Hopefully you learned something uh, cool about technology and about, uh, some craft beer. So We'll keep these going uh, and uh, yeah, join us for our next one. But thanks again for, for joining us today. Have a good night. Thank thanks, you. Thanks everyone.